Welcome to this reaction event. I'm delighted that we're joined by Gavin Esler, author of this fascinating new book, How Britain Ends. And um, if you're not a subscriber to Reaction, subscribe to our YouTube uh, channel and also subscribe to the site. Now, Gavin, the premise of this is that effectively that Britain is uh, is doomed as a concept or the United Kingdom is is doomed as a concept. How did you come to that conclusion? Well, no, nothing's inevitable, obviously, Ian, and it's good to talk to you and uh, and also everybody who listens in and reads Reaction Life. Um, uh, I think there's a number of things. One is the United Kingdom has been a most amazing concoction, hasn't it? So successful, invented in 1603 when Scotland and England joined the Union of the Crowns, reinvented with the Union of Parliaments a century later, reinvented when Ireland joined in 1801, and then forcibly reinvented in the 1920s. Um, it's about time for at least a think about whether it's worth saving. And I wrote the book because I thought there is an astounding complacency in this country, and particularly in England, because uh, England is the dominant part of the United Kingdom, 80 plus percent of the population. Uh, people haven't had to think about the union. In Scotland, people have had to think about the union because of the impulse for Scottish nationalism and independence. And in uh, Northern Ireland, for other obvious reasons that we can maybe go into in detail later, people have thought a lot about, am I British, am I Irish, am I both? And so I wrote the book partly to say to those who are of a unionist persuasion, it's not perfect. And in fact, the tectonic plates of what we think of as the United Kingdom are shifting and I think are moving apart, perhaps inexorably, but they're moving apart. And so it was a wake up call to unionists and to nationalists. It's, it, the impulse was to say, what do you mean by independence in mm -hmm. an interdependent world? I mean, nobody's going to tow Scotland and Wales in one direction and, you know, Ireland and England in another direction, as the cover of the book suggests is a good, good metaphor. That isn't going to happen. So we are stuck with each other in some ways because we're going to be interdependent. So what do you really mean by independence? So those two impulses, uh, wake up call to the uh, unionist sentiment and also saying to nationalists, what have you really thought through about where we're going? And Brexit. It's a big part of it. I mean, we we were obviously on different sides of the of the Brexit argument, but it, it's it's clearly unleashed something, uh, or, or intensified or amplified the the, the, the feeling in, in Scotland or the, the the nationalist part of Scotland or the all now the independence curious portion of uh, of the electorate. You could have described it as um, having your European identity removed. Do you think a lot of Scots feel that? Yes, I do actually. Uh, and in fact, uh, so I, I talked in kind of general terms about the impulse for the book, in specific terms, the impulse for the book was a couple of conversations I had in 2019. So after a couple of years of uh, the Brexit referendum, where as we all know, Scotland went one way, England went another, Northern Ireland also agreed to uh, remain, although the sizable minorities to, to leave in both Scotland and Northern Ireland, but they, they did vote in a different way. And it was kind of obvious to me that there would be stresses and strains, but it never became clearer than in 2019 when I went to school in Edinburgh and I went back as I go most years uh, in the summer, particularly for the Edinburgh Festival, and I hung out with a lot of my friends who had been against Scottish independence in 2014. And by 2019, the word is scunnered, uh, sickened, uh, the Scottish word, by the, the mess that Brexit, as they saw it, was, uh, was uh, leading to. Uh, and also by the fact that they felt that the premise of the remaining in the United Kingdom in 2014 was you can be Scottish and British and European if you, if you remain in the UK. But if you vote to leave Scotland, you'll be out of the UK and you'll be out of the EU. And we promise you that the only way to stay in the European Union is to vote no to independence. And many of the people I know who would be, I don't know whether they're big C conservatives, but quite a few were small C conservatives, were absolutely appalled by this. And so uh, I think the SNP, 
if they want to win independence, those people, Remainers in Scotland, are perhaps quite fertile ground, given that 62% of Scotland voted Remain uh, for, for them. And a, a couple of months later, I was in Belfast. I've got family in Northern Ireland, and I was at a, a festival in Belfast. And it was just as Boris Johnson met Leo Varadkar in the Wirral and destroyed his red lines about, you know, what is the future of Northern Ireland? Yeah. He, he, he had said, which did not go down well, except with comedians, he had already said that the Irish border is basically no more significant than the border between Camden and, um, and Westminster. Uh, and of course, that led to a great deal of derision, because uh, you may be able to collect um, uh, charges very easily on that one border, but in between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic, we did 30 years of terrorism. And when he met Leo Varadka and changed the rules, uh, I was with a, a group of uh, Northern Ireland unionists. And one said to me, when Boris Johnson says he's a one nation conservative, that one nation is England. It is not the United Kingdom, it is not Britain. So, I mean, these are points of view, these are anecdotes, but they mm -hmm. also play into, there's quite a lot of evidence from opinion polls and so on, that I wasn't talking to some kind of fringe, I was talking to people who really formally cared about the union in various ways and care much less now or feel very unsettled. And in the case of Northern Ireland, again, it was said to me repeatedly, Mrs. Thatcher said Northern Ireland is as British as Finchley. Boris Johnson has made it as British as France. Now, that's not quite true, but I can see where people are coming from. Yeah. Do you think that that is, is that fixable? We'll come, we'll come on to later on to the constitutional solutions, but do, do you think, is that a potentially a, a temporary shift or is this, a, is this going to become deeply, deeply established that there's sort of no way back for, uh, back for, back for the union? Well, that's the, that is the big question. Uh, I would I would put it back to you in a kind of rhetorical question, which I'll attempt I'll attempt mm. to answer. But I'm happy to hear yours, which is, who speaks for the union? Who really speaks for being British now? Who credibly in politics? I mean, of course, Her Majesty the Queen is a, the figurehead, and so on. We, we we get all that. But who is the person who has got a vision for what the United Kingdom could look like in the future if it stays united? And the Prime Minister and I talked to a lot, I'm sure you talked to a lot of Scottish Conservatives as well, this Prime Minister is not either that messenger or has that message in a way in which Scots in particular and also Northern Ireland people who are very much like Scots in many ways uh, uh, feel really appeals to them. Yeah. And I know um, from people in the Scottish National Party, they complain when Boris Johnson comes to Scotland and are secretly delighted and I know Scottish Conservatives who say, oh, we're very glad to see the Prime Minister and are secret, secretly think this sort of 1930s Richmond Crompton lashings of ginger beer for tea kind of rhetoric just doesn't work uh, for the people yeah. they need to convince. And I, I, I don't know whether you agree with that, but I think I, that I, is a problem. I, I, think that's, I think that's fair. That I think he, he is, as a leading historian put it to me, he's the kind of... Englishman, not my view, but he's the kind of Englishman that a lot of Scots are trained to dislike. It is, you mentioned Richmond Crompton, perhaps, perhaps P.G. Woodhouse is a, you know, another thing to invoke. And the, the, the routine, which I think plays brilliantly with a lot of working class voters in, in England, actually, they see in it something which is which is fun and um, inherently English, and they're kind of in on the in on the joke. Just has zero resonance uh, in in Scotland. So that that is you're absolutely right. I think that is a that's a problem for, for for the unionists. The other problem is, I think unionists are divided, and I know there'll be some nationalists watching uh, watching this. And but I'm you know as someone who wants the, the union to survive, I'm very happy to admit it. It is a strategic problem beyond the Scottish elections and leading up to if there is another referendum, which is that some unionists want the status quo. A few want to go back, but there's no there's no mm. real going back to un unpicking devolution. It's it's just it's a fact of life. Others want 
a complete rethink of the United Kingdom on a federal, or as you describe it, federal or confederal basis. Mm. And opinion spans, you know, it's, it's quite a broad, yeah. broad span. So you've got Gordon Brown saying one thing for the Labour Party, uh, which is complete rethink of the United Kingdom. Boris Johnson saying his thing, and it's it's then makes it very difficult for one voice or a coherent group of voices to make one case because there isn't beyond the good that the union does, which I would argue is considerable. There isn't really a co a single vision of unionism. That's a difficulty. Yeah. I I mean I I agree with a lot of that, and I think, but I think uh, I I wrote the book. I had in my mind that yes, Scots and and people from Ulster and, and Irish people. And actually I've, I've had a lot of, a lot of inquiries from Germany and, and Spain and, and, and so on. But I wrote this for your average English person to say, you know, where does England fit in all this? Uh, you see much more, many more England flags. Uh, 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 there's always a good side of nationalism. There's, there's always in, everywhere, a, a potentially a slightly more difficult side, but what does England see its future? And has England not got a, a democratic deficit? So while I, um, just to give you one example, it, it seemed to me appalling actually, that 3.8 million people who voted for UKIP in 2015 ended up with no seats. They got one seat, which was Douglas Carswell who quit uh, and mm -hmm. became an independent and then out of politics. And it just seemed to me quite extraordinary that a population in England of almost 4 million people had no clear representation, even though I didn't agree with them. Whereas under another system, uh, they would have had some 80 seats in parliament or something. And Nigel Farage would have got into parliament and, and so on. And I'm not, I'm not making a case for them, but I did think there is something flawed, surely, with the, the system. And I admit very, very um, obviously, as somebody who's been a journalist for years, constitutional questions are boring. Mm. The question of how you rewrite a constitution, the question about when you put to people, would you like a kind of, you know, single transferable vote or an AMS, you know, all those systems, the, even my eyes glaze over. And yet there is surely a democratic deficit in England, which is reflected in some ways in, uh, and again, I'm not saying Fed, a federal system would work in England itself. I don't think Wessex is going to rise from the, you know, I don't think the sort of, um, mm a thousand year plus back in history is a place to go. But what would make it, um, uh, where would be some of the, the great local government figures like Joseph Chamberlain from the, from the 19th century, where would they rise up? Now we've got mayors and so on. And again, because people get quite bored with this, when it came to, um, did you want, do you want mayors in the Northeast of England and so on, people voted against and that's, that's, that's perfectly fine if they're happy with it. But I think one of the biggest flaws of all is the Westminster system and the complacency about Westminster. Now, where we go with that, I think you and I may disagree, or I, I, frankly, I'm open to ideas, but the Westminster system itself doesn't seem to function for most people. And just one final point on that. The Edelman Trust Barometer is just an interesting reflection of, the, the, every year they do look at 28 OECD, so rich countries, and say, do you trust the structures of your government? Do you trust NGOs? Do you trust the media? And so on. Uh, in the last survey, which was last, the 2020 survey, the United Kingdom came second from bottom for trust in government, media, NGOs, and business. They came 27th out of 28, and 28th was Putin's Russia. Now, whether you're a unionist or a nationalist or whatever you're, that's not a great place to be. I'm glad we're better than Putin's Russia, really glad. But you know, there is something broken in the system and I think people get that. What we do about fixing it is a, a much more tricky matter. I think you raise a really interesting point about what is the English response? Because I, I think part of the difficulty with con the notion of constitutional reform is it's been dominated for a very long time by, you know, if you go back to the 80s and 90s, the sort of Charter 88 crowd. And it became a progressive project in the, uh, in the, in the 90s and 2000s, in which Scotland would get its parliament, Wales would get something close to a parliament, Northern Ireland would get the Good Friday Agreement and all the constitutional fudges and uh, investment involved in that. And England, because it's too 
big for the rest of rest of the union the old is it ludovic kennedy's phrase about yeah. being in bed with an elephant or i can't remember if it's yeah kennedy it was ludovic kennedy in bed with the elephant and uh, yeah. the elephant getting a bit restless which so is... there was always this sense so this was always a, 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 a criticism which anti-devolutionists had for example of gordon brown was that he was content to see all of that constitutional development outside england but when it came to england england could not it couldn't risk England being seen as a nation or as something distinct regard, uh, requiring political representat representation. So from an English perspective, and this is why I think the vote lost in the Northeast, it was seen as carving up England because Labour couldn't intellectually, and uh, Liberal Democrats too, confront the idea that England was a place. Mm -hmm. While simultaneously, culturally, there's this huge surge in Englishness, which I think has its roots actually in the 1960s, the mid 1960s, and a shift away from, I think it's about music and fashion, sort of 65, 66, people starting to see England as a place to be proud of, and you didn't have to just ape Americanism. So you get this, this beginning of a rebirth. By 1990, the England football team is singing with New Order, you know, England, uh, and it's a, a multiracial, optimistic vision of England. It's there in 1996. I was there at Euro 96 when Gaza scored his, scored his goal. Um, a brilliant, annoying goal that was as a Scotland, as a Scotland fan. And the old Wembley Stadium was covered with, with, uh, mm -hmm. with the cross of St. George rather than the, rather than the Union flag wasn't ent entirely a new development because things had already been complicated in, in 1966. But you see this long uh, resurgence of English identity, but with nothing to match it politically. And I think, I mean, that's one of the questions I had for you is, and, and you're it's very good in the final section of the book, you're, you, don't lay down, you don't lay down a map and say, it has to be this. This is the only solution you raise various, altern uh, various uh, potential alternatives. But what do you think would solve that problem of giving England sufficient representation, um, but also giving the great cities of England um, mm. additional rep uh, representation in a way that's coherent? Or maybe there isn't an answer. Well, I think, I think every, I, I raise two or three potential solutions. Uh, and like you, I think, you know, the Bruges group have suggested we can kind of go back to pre-devolution. I don't think that's that's not mm. going to happen. So the question is, uh, and also I don't think that's right, actually. I think people people really identify with their local areas. And, and you know, I, I say in the book, you know, if you watch the news in Scotland, the stuff that most Scots care about, the health of the, the, the family, the education and so on, uh, is locally administered, even if there's a sort of, you know, in the NHS and with the vaccine and so on, that is a UK endeavour. Um, and so I think every solution is, is fraught with, with, with problems, which is why perhaps a constitutional convention, as, as Keir Starmer seems to want, may actually happen. Although, uh, just, just as an aside, Labour's part in this is to not represent anything really in Scotland. So it's a, it's a real problem for Labour. Um, and I know a Scottish Conservative who said to me, the only way to keep the United Kingdom together is for Labour to get their act together. That from a Scottish Tory is quite interesting. Um, I, I, I think uh, I think England is the biggest piece of the puzzle, and England is the most difficult piece of the puzzle because people in England haven't had to think about this. As uh, I was, um, I was on. I won't say who it was with, but I was on with a very distinguished TV and radio presenter recently, who introduced my book as "How England Ends," and I said, "There'll always be an England." I'm, that's absolutely not what, I mean, I was polite. This is absolutely not what the book's about. It's about whether this wonderful confection of the United Kingdom or Britain or Great Britain, however we're going to call it, whether that's coming to an end. So we did the interview for about <laughs> half an hour. And at the very end, the presenter said, and that was Gavin Esther, the author of How England Ends. So I thought, well, that didn't go very well. Um, in, in, terms of, in terms of the structure, look, um, Local government has been bled 
uh, by years of austerity and so on. And, and you know, local government is a, is a patchy thing. There are one or two cities, and uh, I'm not going to name any, but they have problems with how, how they're run. But people are still proud to come from these areas. So I, I, I think you could begin. I, I, I say in the book, we federalize by stealth. And we, federal, by, we federalize very badly. And so I'm pleased, for example, that there may be, I know this is hateful to say, another reorganization of the National Health Service in England because it doesn't work, it's spaghetti. Uh, the, the question is, can you give uh, within England a degree of local control that takes it away from Westminster? And how do you do that? And how do you, I, I don't think, the West Lothian question about Scots voting and English issues is a really live question. You know, first of all, they tend not to. I can't think of any major issue where Scots have sort of snubbed English people on an English issue. So I don't think the West Lothian question, oh, it's interesting to discuss. It doesn't, there's no um, West, you know, it, you don't get the same thing in Bavaria, the, the Bavarian question. You don't get the same thing in, in Switzerland and other federal or confederal systems. Um, so that's not the issue. The issue is how do you how do you devolve more power? Should it be another English Parliament? I don't think that works. I do think that you could work a Westminster system if it reflected more closely the people who vote for it. And one of the problems I think first past the post has really unfortunately just doesn't work. I mean, it's not just that Scotland has not voted for a Conservative government since 1955. It is that 43.6% um, of the population voted for uh, Boris Johnson's government in 2019, and he gets 100% of the power and a majority of 80 seats. And I think that is difficult to sustain in the 21st century. Uh, and I think the I think the elected House of uh, I think the unelected House of Lords mm. is. Um, I'm sorry, but that is really should be retired to the horse and cart era. It just doesn't work. So that's that. Sorry, just, just, just on, on that point. So that is one place where you could see uh, some movement and some change. And I'm absolutely open to ideas. And I just raise a few in the book. What do you make of the proposal by the constitutional um, reform group, which I should declare is uh, uh, is 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 it was set up by uh, Lord Salisbury, uh, chairman of chairman of reaction now the way that they envisage it is and they they don't deal they don't propose a, an, an answer for the english question but in uk terms they envisage the a, a reformed house of lords or the house of lords becoming if you like the uk senate mm. and maximal devolution and not a written constitution, but with a new a new act of union, which essentially establishes where the how the, the the power is divided. Which then I suppose people would say, well, what happens to England? But England could then England's chamber could become the House of Commons. There's then a debate to be had about where the Prime Minister is drawn from. Probably, ideally, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is then drawn from the from the elected uh, Senate of Nations and Regions. And then England and its departments like uh, education and health and all the rest of it can be um, can be run with the exec with the executive answerable to to the House of Commons. Could that work? Uh, yeah, I don't go into that in in the book because there were there were a number of other mm. similar kind of solutions that we could go into. But I think that has the bones of a, of potential success. I think I think there has to be some kind of uh, I like the system in the Irish Republic of uh, having people associated with an area, but having multi-member constituencies. And I think that reflects, so if you had, for instance, I don't know, in the Northeast, three Labour MPs, two, conserv uh, two Conservative MPs and one Lib Dem, because that's what the public wanted proportionately, and that w went to, uh, to the upper house, the Senate, that would be a, a reasonable idea. I think uh, you would have then though, in that case, the House of Commons would be a de facto English Parliament, wouldn't it? Because, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't see any particular reason why it shouldn't be, except, and that's the reason I wrote the book, there's a, the, the complacency and the inertia, and I confess, as I say, that it is quite boring to try, you do not get votes by standing up saying, I'm gonna have a constitutional convention. I mean, Keir Starmer may be right on it, but it's not a big vote winner. Um, uh, and what I, worry about 
is that we are sleepwalking into a kind of zombie union where like like a bad marriage where nobody is happy but nobody really wants to walk away because it's too expensive and we've looked at the cost of brexit and that's bad enough and can we possibly do this and so nobody's happy so we have years and years of bickering and there was you know historical parallels are sometimes useful sometimes not but there were years of bickering about ireland from about the 1880s onwards well actually earlier than that but but in particular it came to a crunch by 1914 and then the war happened and then the you no know, i'm not i'm not suggesting some terrible violence or anything like that but i'm just suggesting that if reasonable people don't look at what lord salisbury and others are talking about and at least think about it we will end up getting worse and worse and more tetchy and there'll be more problems and brexit will be part of it and we're already seeing that in northern ireland where Northern Ireland Unionists, the newsletter, the Northern Ireland Unionist paper, day after day has got, you know, criticisms of Brexit. How did we get into this? What have, have we been sold down the river? All that kind of stuff. So the only way to stop stop that kind of talk is to offer somebody something positive. And that may be the bones of something positive. I wonder if the, if the answer lies, uh, or a big part of the answer lies in the revival of the Labour Party. <laughs> Whether that's happening, that's a that's a question question mark. The the Starmer is obviously built on this. Uh, you know, we've we learned in the last couple of years that actually the two party system in England is still really amazingly resilient mm -hmm. at repelling you know new new um, parties from left and right and and centre, and that he does seem to have got Labour back within. Sort of neck and neck or touching distance of of the Tories, so it could end up being that he puts together something as of the kind that we've just been discussing as a pitch to England and to settle the constitutional question with a constitutional convention, but which does actually acknowledge England, mm -hmm. which then begs the question about the the upcoming election. I've just written a piece for reaction on precisely this, which is that so much of it rests on whether the Labour Party in Scotland, and don't, yeah. don't laugh, this seems like a distant possibility, whether it can revive in some way. Now, Sorry, look, I am going to laugh. <laughs> looking, at the, looking at the polling this morning, yeah, um, it's, you know, in the Scotsman uh, Comrades polling, Labour is down at sort of 18 points, 16 points mm. on, the, on, the, on the constituency vote. The Nationalists, for all of their problems, are up at above 50 percent so yeah. that suggestion looks ludicrous for the moment but I, I wonder actually because to deny the nationalists a majority you're not talking about the, the Labour Party doesn't need to go from 18 points in Scotland to 30 or 35 the unionists would like that to happen it really has to take in the next three months a tall order about four, five, six, seven points off, off the SNP. I think the thing to look out for is that uh, Labour in Scotland is about to get a new leader, someone who's actually rather interesting, Anna Sawa. Mm. It's, I just think it's not impossible to imagine a situation in which post the beginnings of reopening in April, Labour's offer for the first time in more than a decade in Scotland is actually quite a coherent one because it involves a new leader, and a fresh face. Uh, it involves Gordon Brown campaigning with him on the basis that we've discussed, advocating a constitutional convention uh, and sorting out, um, sorting out the UK. And it involves Keir Starmer, who is a credible potential UK-wide prime minister. So I, I think the, the question in the next three months is, is that worth four or five points in the polls because it because if the nationalists don't get an overall majority if they end up relying on the greens or they fall short and the turnout which we've no idea whether the turnout's going to be 52 percent sort of typical for a scottish parliament election or whether because of postal voting it's going to rocket or we've no idea but if if they do fall short on a low turnout then the positions really, really could look quite different by the summer. So much rests on on the Scottish Labour Party. I mean, when we were covering Scotland, uh, I mean, the idea of 
the Labour Party being in a sub 20 percent and the nationalists yeah. being on 54 percent would have would have seemed incredible. Um, but I just wonder whether things could shift. You could be right. And I agree. Anna Sawar is an interesting figure and he will be uh, he may have a honeymoon in Scotland. Uh, and Keir Starmer has got the right name, Keir, Keir Hardy, you know, uh, uh, and he he has. How can I put this? Um, he has a manner which I think will appeal to quite a few Scots in the sense that he is a fundamentally serious I would almost say, as somebody with a Scottish Presbyterian background, a Presbyterian manner about him. Yeah. And I think, and, and, and a lawyer and all those kind of things that might click. So that's one, one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is the SNP have been running Scotland for more than a decade and they're still popular. And they're still popular because, I think, not because of it, individual questions about competence in this area or that area, which they directly deal with. But because of, of Brexit, what we've seen in England, how, how the, those tectonic plates have shifted, and the, the fact that you know there are very few po politicians who, after ten years in power, thirteen years in power, can still be popular and can still be in there with a chance of actually getting a majority of the votes, and also the Greens. I mean, I don't know how they will play it, but even if they fall short, they will say in the end that the vote for the Green Party is also a vote for a, a Scottish mm -hmm. referendum. As, uh, and I think the Greens would, ag would, would agree with that. So it, it is difficult. And Labour, Labour's big problem is, it seems to me in Scotland, is how can they break away from the past and the vow? And, you know, uh, as you know, when Gordon, uh, the vow for, for, for those who, who are not in Scotland, it was when the three unionist parties, Conservative, Labour and the Liberal Democrats essentially said, There'll be some kind of tinkering with um, devolution uh, and you, you should stay, we, we promise you that things will be, in some way get better, which was interpreted in different ways by different folk, but has allowed the SNP to say that was a complete falsehood. Uh, I mean, it just didn't happen. In other words, as soon as David Cameron won the 2014 uh, vote uh, against uh, Scottish independence, uh, he got focused on English votes for English laws. What can we do about UKIP? He focused on something else. He didn't deliver. And that's the way it is, it's seen. So I agree with the basic premise, which is, and it, you're the second Scottish Conservative in two days who said to me exactly the same thing. It's all up to the Labour Party. Well, then you can blame them if it goes wrong. But um, I would say it's a very tough ask in three months and they have not done well over the past few years and they had huge structural problems in yeah. Scotland huge huge structural problems uh, uh, and they haven't really re recovered from that so you may be right but I, yeah. I wouldn't hold my breath on it no 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 good, no good advice and it, um, it may be also maybe the wrong point in the cycle because there isn't a UK Westminster election for uh, you know until um, 2024 mm -hmm. so the the notion that Starmer is a potential prime minister may, may not count for very much but I mean but what I mean by that is that or why that that matters is that is that the the Labour Party was very useful to huge numbers of Scottish voters when when it was capable of beating the Tories in England so everyone goes on about sort of Blair you know, being unpopular in Scotland, but actually Blair mm -hmm. did brilliantly in Scotland in 97, 2001, and even in 2005, did, you know, the, the Nats never really, never really broke through. So if you didn't want, you were Scottish and you didn't want a Tory government, you could vote Labour and, and you knew that they were a UK wide force and you wouldn't end up with a Tory government. So it seems to me crucial for that, notion or the possibility to be re-established ed miliband would say that that's what he was trying to do in 2015 but it obviously obviously didn't work but that offer that uk-wide offer hasn't really been a fact hasn't really been a factor aiding labor for since 2010 and since since, mm -hmm. since brown lost power and it, and it might come back but 12 weeks is it's hard. Very, yeah. very difficult to get even sort of name recognition and, and any breakthrough, but there will be leader debates of some sort. That's another factor and they will be watched 
and Sturgeon has had everything pretty much her own way in terms of the daily briefing screen by the BBC. So, yeah, I, I'm not pred- I'm not predicting yeah. it. I'm just saying it's a really. I, I think it's it's it, it's the most fascinating story in British politics at the moment, and on it hangs so much. Yeah, I know I, the future I, of the UK. I, I I agree. I think I think the difference. You're right. From 2010 to 2015. Uh, what happened to Labour is is really worth looking at uh, in Scotland. And I, m- my sense is that they were still riding high right up to 2014, but post the yeah. independence vote and post the vow uh, and David Cameron's failure to, in the view of many Scots, to deliver something, I think that was what killed uh, David Miliband in the 2015 election. And after all, if he'd held... Ed Miliband... Up, Sorry, Ed Miliband. If, if Ed Miliband had held for Labour half the Scottish seats, he would have been Prime Minister in 2015. And he didn't. Uh, and that's one of the great what-ifs. I mean, both Milibands are talented. I do confuse them, but they're both talented. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you think there's a, there's a possibility that, because of course, while you were writing this, the pandemic was unfolding, uh, and then, but very late in the day, the the vaccine uh, vaccine delivery starts, where the UK, having had an appalling start to the pan- pandemic, um, actually does quite well. Certainly, in the, it's it's early days, early days on vaccination. But mm-hmm. do you think that that could have uh, could have quite a, a deep impact in terms of perceptions of? what the UK is. It's quite difficult now for um, uh, for a campaigner in Scotland to say, well, what's the UK ever done for us? Or what does the UK ever do for us? Because the answer, the riposte from a unionist is, well, early vaccines is, that's, that, that's not a bad thing. Um, the common clout that comes from borrowing, uh, combined borrowing power and tax and spend, that's worth having as well. If unionists phrase that correctly and accurately, in terms of look what we do together, yeah, rather than Scotland couldn't do it on its own, which is just is is designed to is a is a, is a way of thinking which just fuels uh, nationalism. But there is a positive positive message there that could make a difference. There there is, and there's also a negative message about the EU and the way in which the Commission EU Commission handled it which was badly uh, because the EU should have been able to say that's one of the reasons why we're inter- interdependent look at the clout that we have uh, I think you may be right in the short term and I think that may play in the, the I think there will be a bounce for the Johnson government uh, in 2021 uh, I suspect that is is true and he's it, you know despite various problems that's holding up I think the things against that would be a, if it's misplayed, as you suggest, if it's a kind of you Scots are so useless you can't do it yourself, I think that would be a huge, huge, huge mistake. Um, uh, and I also think that uh, we will have to see how this plays out over the next three or four years, because if we're talking about the slow shifting of people's views, mm-hmm. um, by 2024, 2025, uh, th- there's not going to be, a, there's not going to be a sort of sudden surge for Scottish independence, which is going to rise up or, or anything in Northern Ireland for that matter, which we haven't really touched on. But, but uh, it, it, we're talking about what the next decade might look like. And so the vaccine procurement has been wonderful. Uh, and I think it will, you know, let's hope it continues and let's hope we get rid of this and can kind of move on to wherever the new normal is. But it may not be lasting. And what may be lasting is resentment over Brexit and trade. Now, these some of those things might might go um, uh, and be sort be sorted out, particularly in Northern Ireland. And I hope soon, because things are think, think things are not not good. Um, but the final point I'd make is that many of the things, I, as you know, I compare in the book some of the rhetoric about Scottish independence with some of the rhetoric about Brexit and take our country back and 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 take back control and all all, all that sort of thing. And in the end. Uh, when I've talked to people in the, the Irish Republic about, would you vote for Irish unity, bearing in mind what you would have to take on if Northern Ireland came with you? 
and I bet some of them make um, rather rude comments, but, but in a jokey way. And some of them say it would be an economic cost to us, but in the end, a feeling of identity, of nationalism may triumph economics. And I would suggest that that has happened in Brexit, at least in the short term, we'll see how it works out. And it may happen for Scotland as well. So if they're told, look what you get out of this union. I think, I think a, a more potent argument would be, would be, but I don't think anybody in this government could make it, which is you've seen how wonderful Brexit has been in terms of breaking up a union of less than 50 years. Wait till you try and break up something of 450, 500 years, then you're in trouble. So um, nobody's going to be making, apart from me perhaps, that argument. Uh, I don't think anybody in the Conservative Party is, uh, is prepared, prepared for that. Uh, maybe the Labour Party would. They'd be, there we are. Maybe we're on to something. The Labour Party could say. Insulted. <laughs> but I think I think I think that point on the on the, on the the vaccines is very well made. Which we, we sit we don't know how the program is going to unfold over the next few years. We also don't know what view voters will form of it longer term. Does it does it become this dominant folk memory that you know the time that Britain mm -hmm. sort of got it right, which eclipses what happened earlier in the, in, in the crisis, mm -hmm. which was yeah. pretty calamitous, or is it something which sometimes happens with electorates, doesn't it? it happened in, I'm not comparing it with 1945, but in 1945, voters can sort of bank a success or, or, or mm -hmm. victory in that case and just say, and just say, well, we did that. We'll now make another set of choices. We'll, we'll, we'll see. It's kind of unknown. Yeah. That's a good point, actually. I mean, uh, you know, because I, I find, uh, I find the take back control rhetoric uh, quite irritating. I'd, I'd rather take forward something, you know, and uh, you may be right that people, voters might say job done. I hope, I hope we can say job done actually and, and put credit and blame wherever it's due, but it would be good if we could just forget about coronavirus. I don't think we will, unfortunately. I, I mean, that's, that, that's my hope without sort of rerunning the, uh, you know, rerunning the, the, the Brexit debates, which we've had many, had many times is that, is that the what happened with the vaccines and, and, and the commission? If if it if it actually settles helps settle that argument, and we can get a lot of that energy from Remainer Britain that's engaged in politics and interested in the future of the uh, future of the country, which I detected was starting to think about. You know, rejoin or mm. um, you know refight it, refighting that war if it's then channeled into other things remaking the const remaking the constitution social mobility um improving the, you know improving the country and i know people who want to rejoin the european union see that as see that as improvement then it could actually it, a healthier politics could emerge or am i being too optimistic well, no, I, well, I don't know. I, I hope so. I mean, uh, uh, constantly I thought as I was writing the book, we are better than this, you know, we're better than this. I would, uh, you know, as you know, the book is quite often a work of literary criticism, a lot of Shakespeare in it, there's a lot of Blake, there's a lot of, uh, you know, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Blake. and Jez, Butter, Jez Butterworth, exa ex exactly, train spotting, uh, to look at how we see ourselves. Mm -hmm. And how we see ourselves is often absolutely brilliant absolutely brilliant and we have got such talent we've got more you know more nobel prizes from one cambridge college than china and japan put together apparently um so we have got so much going for ourselves and nobody is going anywhere nothing is going to be towed into the atlantic no part of it equally we're not going to be separated any more than 26 miles from 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 the european union so we just have to figure out a better way of getting on with each other internally and also getting on with our nearest neighbours for all the flaws that we see in each other and there believe me there are plenty so I, I don't think you're being too optimistic you're being you're being hopeful I'm hopeful <laughs> hope, it, hope is good so hope Gavin, is good. Gavin Gavin Esler um, recommend this fascinating book how England ends that was a joke <laughs> how you're how fired. Britain how Britain ends Thank you. Thank you. Nationalism and the Rebirth of Four Nations. Really, really interesting book. And thank you very much for taking the time today and uh, for a fascinating conversation. Thanks, Ian. Thanks very much. Very enjoyable.